Okay, I think folks may still be arriving, but we're gonna go ahead and get rolling. Um, I wanna welcome everybody who's here this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name's Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. And tonight I'm really excited to be hosting writers, Christian Alexander and Matthew Lyons, uh, whose new book, Three-Way Fight, uh, Revolutionary Politics and Anti-Fascism, which came out with PM Press. Uh, it's a robust introduction to the three-way fight approach to anti-fascism um, that's become increasingly influential over the last two decades. Uh, and clocking in with a little less than two decades, uh, Firestorm is a 16-year-old uh, radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective uh, here in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And as a collective, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Uh, we're continuing to do a certain number of events every month uh, online, like this one, because we love to be able to reach people at a distance, um, including authors who might not make it to Asheville. And also because we know that for lots of folks in our community, um, COVID and other barriers remain in place. Um, and uh, it's nice to be able to, to participate in things without that. So if you're interested in catching up for additional virtual events, definitely um, connect with us on social media where we tend to post about things that are upcoming um, or join our newsletter, which if we're doing well, we send out once a month. Um, so you will not be overwhelmed. Uh, and our next virtual event is actually gonna be a conversation with uh, a handful of authors who are using tarot to explore revolutionary possibilities. Uh, that's also a, a PM Press collaboration, and it's happening on Monday, August 19th, and you can sign up for that on our website. I'm going to share some links in a minute here. So note that we are using uh, Zoom's um, kind of webinar tool today. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, feature that allows you to kind of pose questions to um, Christian and Matthew and would really love uh, to hear from you tonight. So please, as we go, uh, write out those questions, um, put them in the Q&A, and uh, after kind of a presentation, then we'll come circle around and uh, do our best to engage with, with what we get. Uh, and if you're on your phone, I think the Q&A tool is at the top of your screen. Um, if you're on a computer, it's at the bottom. It looks like two little speech bubbles, so you can find that. Okay, so we're gonna get started now. Uh, Christian Alexander first became part of the revolutionary and anarchist youth movements of the late 1980s, and has spent the better part of his time on earth participating in anti-cop, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, and anti-fascist organizing and action. He works in emergency and trauma medicine and is an avid supporter of music, art, and radical subcultures, and has been involved in uh, three-way fights since its founding in 2004. Uh, Matthew Lyons is the author of Insurgent Supremacists, the U.S. Far Right's Challenge to State and Empire, uh, and also co-authored with Chip Brillet, uh, Right-Wing Populism in America. Uh, he's been a contributor to Three-Way Fight since 2005, and his writings have also appeared in several other leftist and mainstream publications. Matthew is co-trustee of the Lorraine Hansberry uh, Literary Trust, which stewards the literary legacy of the late play, uh, playwright and activist Lorraine Hansberry. Um, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate both of you for making time uh, and excited to hear more about this important book project. Thank you, Liberty. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And um, thank you to the um, Firestorm Books Collective for the invitation. We're really happy to have this opportunity to talk with everybody. And, and thank you to everybody who's, who's um, watching, listening in, and, um, and also those who may uh, watch this uh, after, you know, in, in the recorded version. Um, I'm going to just uh, kind of do a quick outline of what we want to do uh, with this session, and then and then we're going to kind of uh, trade off uh, Christian and I uh, covering different parts of the presentation. Um, so basically, there's there's kind of three things that we want to do in, in terms of a quick uh, introduction. We want to talk about three way fight as a, a, as a concept or as a as an approach to politics, just kind of 
give you um, just a, a basic sense of what that means, what, what it's about. Uh, secondly, we want to talk about the three-way fight project, uh, how that developed, you know, what, what the focus has been, uh, what some of the influences have been, and, and, and a little bit about its, uh, how we see its role within the larger uh, radical and anti-fascist uh, movements and communities. And then we want to talk about the three-way fight book and um, how that uh, came to be uh, and, um, you know, just a, a bit of a, an overview of the, 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 the purpose and the, the different sections and, and, and something of um, uh, at least a little taste of uh, a few of the, the pieces in, in the book. Um, and then we definitely want to leave plenty of time uh, for Q and A. Um, just given the framework, it's not exactly going to be a, a, a open discussion. But but we are very much interested in hearing people's comments and, and questions, and you know we'll do our best to um, res respond to those. Uh, you know, at, you know to the extent that we can within the the, the time and, and the, the framework here. Um, all right, so I'm going to uh, jump in with the, the first section and talk about the concept of, of three-way fight politics. Um, in very broad terms, what we're trying to do is look at the question of what's the relationship between combating the far right and working for systemic radical social change. Um, and, you know, in, in very broad terms, the, the, the quick uh, answer to that question that we, we offer is they're related, but they're not the same struggle. Um, but to kind of uh, spell that out a little bit more clearly, I like to think of three-way fight as opposed to a couple of more standard uh, kind of versions of anti-fascism. There's kind of a mainstream or liberal version which looks at political struggle in terms of a conflict between a supposedly democratic center or, you know, sort of the democratic mainstream and then political extremists on both the right and the left who are seen as threatening this, you know, this democratic um system that we, we supposedly have. And, um, you know, there are a number of problems with this framework, uh, you know, starting with the fact that, you know, in our view, we, we don't live in a democracy. Um, there are many ways in which our political system and our society are deeply undemocratic and uh, founded on all kinds of systems of hierarchy and oppression and exploitation. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's also the problem that if you're talking about the, the extremes, quote unquote, on the right and the left as somehow equivalent, then that's, that fundamentally, um, distorts the underlying principles that these different forces are, are based upon, or, or at least, um, you know, uh, based on in, in, in some degree. And um, so we, um, you know, we have a basic problem with, with that approach, but then there is, you know, a second framework that is common in many parts of the left that is, it, it's, it's also based on a kind of duality uh, or, or binary model of, you know, kind of there are the forces of, uh, of order or forces of oppression and exploitation and all of those who are helping them. And then there are those who are struggling against that. And uh, this um, framework tends to oversimplify the question of fascism, the question of understanding the far right by treating 
you know, the 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 forces of the far right as if they were simply in league with or acting on the, the behest of the people in power. And from our standpoint, um, the, the relationship there is much more uh, complex, that there are certainly some ways in which the far right um, is you know, is first of all rooted in and grows out of an oppressive system and um, in, in some ways is, you know, very much about bolstering and intensifying systems of power, systems of oppression. Um, but there's also ways in which the far right is at odds with the existing system. And um, that's that's an important piece also to understand not just you know for you know as some sort of intellectual exercise, but because it has direct strategic implications. If we want to be able to combat these forces effectively, we need to understand um, you know where they sit in in the larger political framework and in in, in the the relation to uh, other opponents. Um, and there's a very specific kind of historical. Um, historical moment that we think is important here. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, the, the way that American politics was um, set up in the middle of the 20th century, um, pretty much everybody on the right was more or less supportive of what they saw as the American system. Um, it, where you had very explicit hierarchies in terms of race and gender and, you know, other kinds of uh, uh, lines of oppression out there in public. In, in many cases, they were inscribed in laws or at least in, 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 in standard practice. But then with the upheavals of the 1960s and the the uh, black liberation movement and the various other social change forces that um, were largely inspired by and um, and and uh, took energy from from that struggle, you started to see some real changes in the um, those kind of traditional hierarchies, so that um you no longer had the same kind of direct explicit legal or um um practical uh support for all of these systems of power and at, at a certain point sections of the american right started to feel that they were no longer represented by the established order and started to see themselves as in conflict with the uh, people in power. And you started to see um, a, a, a conflict within the US right where there was a section that remained loyal to um, the government and, and established institutions. But then there was another section that said, actually, we have been betrayed by the US government. We have been betrayed by uh, economic and political and cultural elites, and we need to fight back against them. And there were uh, in the 70s and, and then particularly in the 80s and later sections of the far right that um, uh, literally uh, took up arms against um, the US government and um, and 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 declared war on it. So that um, that kind of um, that kind of conflict is not something that you can explain by a, a model that says everybody who is advocating an oppressive hierarchical system is basically on the same side. Clearly, there are some um, some more complexities there that need to be addressed, and that's. Um, that's a lot of what three-way fight is 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 based on is 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 trying to make sense of that complexity, and uh, understand 
what its implications are for um, anti-fascist and radical political practice uh, for organizing and, and for uh, social change work. Some uh, uh, other points that, you know, kind of follow from that um, approach that I just want to mention uh, briefly. Um, you know, first of all, we, we think it's important to take our opponents seriously, to um, not simply uh, repeat the, the kind of standard ideas that, you know, everybody on the far right is a hypocrite or is an opportunist or is crazy. Um, you can find those people there, but um, those are not the ones who are the most dangerous. Um, we need to be willing to question standard assumptions that have circulated in anti-fascist and leftist circles. You know, you will often hear the slogan, the cops and the Klan go hand in hand. Well, sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not true. And if we simply repeat it without thinking about when it's uh, accurate and when it's not, then we're going to make some real mistakes. Um, we need to be sensitive to changes that are going on in the political uh, arena. The, the kinds of uh, political analyses and slogans and organizing uh, approaches that far rightists are using now are very different from what they were using, you know, a generation ago. And to some extent are, you know, different from what they were using just a few years ago. And so those are things that we need to be sensitive to. And I guess lastly for the moment is um, we think it's important just to not act as if we have all the answers. I mean, three-way fight is not a doctrine. It's not a, 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 a complete set of, you know, a, a fully formed analysis. It's an approach. It's, it's a set of questions. It's uh, an effort to raise issues that need more uh, exploration and discussion. And um, so that's... It, it, that's part of what we're trying to do uh, with with the Three Way Fight book, and and you know what we've been trying to do uh, all along with the the Three Way Fight project. Uh, okay, so at this point, I want to turn it over to Christian to uh, talk a bit more about the Three Way Fight project. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone out there, uh, and once again, thanks Firestorm, thanks Liberty, thanks everybody for. Uh, zooming in uh, to listen to uh, us kind of chit chat about this book that came out. Uh, Three-Way Fight, uh, Revolutionary Politics and Anti-Fascism. Uh, it is joint, uh, jointly published by uh, PM Press as well as Chris Blebedev out of uh, Montreal. So uh, we've worked with uh, both those publishers uh, for quite some time and are very proud to have uh, um, them taking an interest in helping get this out. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the three-way fight project is. And, um, so mostly it's a website, uh, other than now the, the book here. And, uh, but it does represent something broader. It, it, it's a politics. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a theoretical framework and it's an ethical stance. Um, it, it, as a loose concept, it, it formed and came out of the broad militant anti-fascist movements grouped mostly around anti-racist action in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, and, and as a specific project, it came together in 2004, coming right after a lot of struggles, uh, several of which uh, were intersecting, mostly the anti-fascist struggles at the time the anti-capitalist, anti-globalization struggles, uh, and then the post 9-11 and the post 9-11 period. Um, you know, in regards to the first, uh, it was after several waves of fascist upsurge and uh, anti-fascist organizing and resistance, uh, and resistance that, that helped uh, with the takedown of several of the then dominant fascist and Nazi organizations of the time. Um, and the book, uh, We Go Where They Go, The Story of Anti-Racist Action, also 
published by PM Press, uh, is, a, is a really good, it's the first real history of anti-racist action. And in that book, it, de it goes into actually pretty explicit detail about a lot of those campaigns that would kind of be uh, the struggles, the resistance, and the political ideas that would be a kind of forerunner to three-way fight. Um, so secondly, uh, after a lot of that, the, the, the explicit anti-fascist, militant anti-fascist struggles, uh, secondly, a lot of uh, militant anti-fascists at the time started to participate in the growing anti-globalization movements. And uh, if we get into the way back machine uh, and we think about like N30, November 30th, the Battle of Seattle, um, but also lots of local and regional organizing that was going on, um, not just on the coast, but also in the Midwest, uh, actions against the transatlantic uh, business dialogue that happened in Columbus. So there was a lot of organizing, a lot of anti-fascists joining in with the anti-globalization and making up a very much the explicit kind of anti-capitalist wing of that movement. Um, so all these, this, these struggles uh, were definitely uh, sharpening up and deepening the analysis and action around the entirety of the authoritarian capitalist system. And it was also where we uh, started to see more far right and explicitly fascist forces trying to insert themselves into the broad anti-globalization movements. So anti-fascists work to expose and challenge the entry of the right and the radical fascists. Lastly, uh, the other element that kind of birthed three-way fight, um, and that's 9-11. So you had this upsurge of, of, of struggle on the anti-fascist fronts and then the anti-globalization, anti-capitalist fronts, but then 9-11 comes and really for people that were active at that time, the world was really plunged into this very dramatic kind of disarray via an attack um, on Western-led imperialist system, but from a revolutionary and reactionary political movement, nominally AQ, uh, but a resistance that was much, much broader and in turn developed lots of new forces and political military offshoots which would then lead to decades of war and an increasing of the state's repressive apparatus. So three-way fight emerged from this whole mix that was going on. Um, so with all this going on and the work in those movements, three-way fights genesis was, was initially a, a small tendency of anti-fascists who also had or wanted a, a more comprehensive vision that would underline and inform our practice and approaches to organizing and action. Uh, it's important to say here, um, and this is something that, that has come up in all, all se semi-mass to mass movements, uh, you know, it, it's important to say that the movements, including the anti-fascist and even the militant anti-fascist movements, uh, well, it, it was not and is not homogenous. There, there were and remain real debates on analysis politics, uh, approaches to action. And, uh, but that's not a negative. Uh, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that helps us grow and develop and maybe get to better ways of thinking and working. Uh, and, and once again, that, that really is kind of a, an impetus, a, a reason to do this three-way fight project. Um, and that relates to how this three-way fight project thing started out. While it was mostly anarchist, uh, it, it wasn't exclusively that. What we looked for uh, were others who had an affinity on questions of opposition to the state, state repression, the police, capitalism, thoroughgoing critiques of, of the system of white supremacy, patriarchy, binary gender stratification, settler colonialism. And, uh, and we wanted an emphasis on direct action and insurgent, perhaps even uh, insurrectionary but, uh, but class struggle and social revolutionary politics uh, from below. So that's a, it's both broad and specific, but these are the elements that helped define three-way fight as both a pole within the militant anti-fascist movements and within the revolutionary anti-capitalist and social struggle movements. Uh, and that's where we started and that's how we organized. Uh, and as three-way fight as a project started to take off, it's also how we made connections with others 
who are grappling with these questions and issues. Um, but even with all that said, uh, in this semi-tendency and what would become a project, there's always been lots of visions and goals and strategies. So the project is one small political analytical expression. Uh, and even here, it doesn't have hard lines or full agreement. Uh, and in large part, this three-way fight project uh, is to challenge our side, uh, inject analysis and debate into our movements. Uh, it's not even to get at answers, uh, but to get sharper, clearer thinking that maybe gets us closer to some answers, but also helps us develop smart and dynamic approaches to, to work and struggle. Uh, so that kind of brings us up to like the book and, and what is the three-way fight book. And uh, so the book, once again, is uh, it's the latest in a series of books and publications. And I have a, an assortment. Um, one of the first books that kind of uh, was geared at anti-fascist, but also within the anti-globalization movement, uh, it, it was a book more of a pamphlet, uh, My Enemy's Enemy. Um, so followed by uh, this book that Chris Blebedeb and members of Chicago Anti-Racist uh, Action helped do, and that was Confronting Fascism. Um, there's some other books, Control, Alt, Delete, trying to get used to that, and uh, Matthew's Insurgent Supremacists. And, uh, you know, those are all books that have come out over the last two two decades. And so we kind of situate uh, three -way, the three-way fight book is, is a follow-up and, and based off of all those thinkings and those works. Uh, you know, there's been some other books that have come out, A Brilliant Red Thread. Uh, there's uh, Anti-Fascism Against Machismo. Uh, and uh, there's also a, a, another one that just came out right as we were putting out the three-way fight book, and it's Genealogies of Anti-Fascism. And all of these books, uh, or at least most, if not all of them, can be got from either PM Press or Chris Blebedev, the left-wing books. Um, so in all these books, while they're having common frameworks for analysis and hopes of helping develop approaches to organizing, uh, they're also dealing with developments of their period. So while there are common themes, questions, and analysis, there's also this notion that politics is always shifting uh, and non-static. Uh, so what we thought yesterday in terms of like our analysis, uh, it has to be adjusted for today and tomorrow. And uh, there's another book that I didn't mention there, um, but I, I like to think uh, there's this notion, uh, or there should be, of old realities and new realities. And I'm, I'm quoting that from the book Night Vision, uh, which is another influential publication and school of thought on three-way fight politics. Uh, and Night Vision itself is connected to, to, to publications like Bottom Fish Blues, Settlers, uh, the, the, the re-autobiography of, of Harriet Tubman. Um, so old realities and new realities, uh, having a non-static uh, view of politics. Um, so a little bit more just about how this book got developed. Uh, we were approached in spring of 2020. So really four years ago, and, and we were approached to do a book to get our specific thinking and ideas out there. And it wasn't something we planned or even had much interest in uh, at first or hadn't thought about. But others saw that this three-way three -way fight thing was being picked up and addressed more broadly than just us who were connected to the then blog, not even a website, uh, just an old blog. So folks said, why don't you, why don't you do a book uh, to make a contribution to the discussions on radical anti-fascism? We were like, ah, okay, we'll try it. Um, so it took four years to think about, select the articles, reselect articles, edit, 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 uh, and we got this book. And um, the book, uh, one, uh, it represents the arc of three-way fight development. Uh, two, uh, it draws from uh, or recognized or intersected with other thinkers and movements who parallel or even directly engage with three-way fight. And three, it establishes what three-way fight was and how it started and progressed that, that arc. Uh, but also 
it puts it into today's context and how its perspectives are relevant to what we're up against now, as well as what might be on the horizons for tomorrow. So uh, this book tries uh, to get a, a bigger view of the social and political crisis and what exists or is emerging uh, in these movements that demonstrate potential challenges to the social order and how uh, we as anti-system or liberatory revolutionaries and anti-fascists can think, organize, and act to both build and deepen these struggles, uh, but also where we see not just what we agree with within these struggles and movements, but where we disagree or even oppose. It's about trying to get some clarity on all matters. Uh, and it's about how to develop a critical estimate of these struggles, while most importantly, having critical estimates, but also being a part of these, these, these struggles in action uh, and being in the mix in real ways. Uh, so, you know, a couple a couple more comments is that this book is intended to challenge, as Matthew was kind of saying earlier, it's intended to challenge simplistic and superficial portrayals of fascism. You know, it argues, it's arguing for a more nuanced analysis of this messy political reality we're in, um, both to help understand why people are attracted to oppressive politics and simultaneously to expose the far right's contradictions and weaknesses. Um, you know, at the same time, the book is trying to argue for ongoing analysis of developments within capitalism and its, its various ruling class sections, including liberal or centrist efforts to co-opt anti-fascism as a tool of state repression and system legitimization. Uh, and, and lastly, and importantly, uh, our intention with the book was to make it a tool it's a book from the movements to the movements. And while we uh, do try to inject some theoretical depth to the book, we also struggled to make it accessible and approachable. And uh, lots of the articles can be standalone pieces with their own insights and lessons. So in the end, it's, it's a mix of ideas, theory, practice, and action. Uh, and at least uh, that was what we were hoping for. You know, the, the verdict, is out until uh, you as readers uh, engage it and let us know what you think uh, and, and how it's a, a, it can either be applied or not to our organizing and our thinking and our movements broadly speak. So uh, I'll kind of, uh, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at my comments at that for now uh, and turn it back over to, to Matthew. Thanks, Christian. Um, what I'm going to do now is give you a little bit more about the, the substance of, you know, what is actually in the book in terms of the, the different sections and the different types of pieces that are, uh, that are included. Um, there's about 30, um, different essays and interviews, and in some cases, position papers, uh, or manifesto kind of pieces that um, we selected. Uh, and uh, some of these are pieces that were originally published on the Three Way Fight blog or the Three Way Fight website. Uh, but then there are also many others that were, um, uh, were not. Um, there are a few new pieces and then various older pieces that appeared um, either before the Three Way Fight project was started or uh, just in, in other uh, platforms, but which we felt um, represented uh, important aspects of the kind of approach that um, we're, we're, we're trying to develop. Um, so to give you some more specifics, um, there, are, there are various pieces that uh, kind of give you uh, sort of some of the, the show, some of the milestones of the uh, kind of forerunners, the, the, the steps leading up to the three way fight uh, concept, um, starting with um, uh, a, a set of theses about fascism that was developed by the Sojourner Truth Organization in the 1980s, a couple of pieces that were um, published in the Anti Racist Action Bulletin. Um, and uh, and then some others. There are um, several pieces that look at 
um, kind of a theoretical framework. For example, there's an essay by um, uh, Roland Kashina Robinson, who is an indigenous Canadian writer, looking at the relationship between uh, a three-way fight approach and uh, settler colonialism. And just how does the, the kind of settler colonialist framework for understanding societies in North America, um, how does that inform and uh, help to, uh, you know, reflect usefully on the three-way fight approach and, and vice versa. Uh, there's also uh, an important um, essay by Tammy Kovich called um, Anti-Fascism Against Machismo, which was uh, it was originally published as a pamphlet and then was included in the the, the book of the same name that um, Christian mentioned earlier. And uh, in Anti-Fascism Against Machismo, um, Tammy is uh, partly um, looking at, you know, giving kind of a, 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 a feminist perspective on uh, the far right and in particular arguing that um, there are complexities there that we need to make sense of. So there, it, it's not, um, if you look at uh, far right gender politics, it's not all, you know, kind of monolithic. It's not that there's simply one, you know, kind of, you know, uniform sexist ideology. There are actually multiple versions of um, male supremacist and patriarchal politics, which are represented in, in, in different ways in different branches of the far right. And that's important to make sense of. Uh, and uh, another part of what she's doing in, uh, in this piece is looking at how um, anti-fascist organizing and practice needs to be feminist. And so, for example, the, the kind of stereotypical model of you know, uh, an Antifa militant uh, as somebody who is male and young and uh, able-bodied and, you know, a fighter, um, we need to, we need to go way beyond that. Not that that is necessarily wrong in itself, but it is, it is, it, it, it is it, 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 inherently a problem in terms of limiting who is, respected for their their work in direct confrontation with the far right but also in terms of the need to respect the many different ways that people have contributed and are contributing to anti-fascist uh, organizing and struggle that are you know of which uh, that kind of direct confrontation is just one small piece and so there are many different kinds of people who uh, are playing important roles uh, and so, you know, these are some examples of, you know, theoretical frameworks that are that are laid out. Um, there's a section that looks at the relationship between uh, the global capitalist ruling class or, you know, or sections of the uh, capitalist ruling class and far right forces uh, in terms of, uh, for example, um, uh, what kind of relationship has Donald Trump and his his uh, presidential campaigns had with capitalists um, and, uh, and and how does that fit in with, you know, just the, the, his challenge to, you know, kind of established political elites. Uh, but then also looking more broadly at the question of how have transnational capitalist forces related to the upsurge of right wing populist and fascist uh, initiatives in, in many different uh, parts of the world. And not simply uh, saying that, oh, well, those are, they're just kind of on the same side. Sometimes there's, there's been collaboration there, but, but also looking at the ways, for example, that uh, capitalist forces have made use of anti-fascism as a tool to further their interests. And that's something that is, it, it's, it's an important theme that we look at in three-way fight. Uh, and related to that, um, there's a there's a section that looks at what we call com, you know complexities, just trying to go beyond sort of standard um, you know sort of pat um, explanations for um, fascist and, and, and anti-fascist confrontations. Uh, 
So, uh, for example, there's a pair of essays in there that, that I wrote, uh, one of which uh, looks at uh, it, it, it looks at a uh, conference in Moscow that was attended by fascist and other far right forces, as well as by some U.S. based uh, Marxist organizations. And so looking at the uh, the very um, real and uh, problematic dynamic of you know what's called you know red red brown alliance building of you know uh, uh, convergence or collaboration between sections of the left and sections of the far right and just you know what is that about and and what kind of dangers does that pose uh, but then uh, a kind of a flip side of that there's a piece um, looking at uh, the Network Contagion Research Institute which is a think tank that uses the the kind of anti-extremism model that I mentioned earlier on of um, equating the radical left and the far right as kind of mirror images of each other and, and sort of um, different uh, kinds of forces that are opposed to the supposed democratic mainstream. Uh, so looking at how that kind of ideology plays out and how it is used to co-opt um, people's fears of the the far right into a kind of system supportive uh, narrative and uh, a um, something that ends up fueling the the um, development of the state repressive apparatus. Um, there are sections that uh, look at just trying to, understand events as they unfold you know we have there there are several pieces that look at the um developments uh across the, the the trump presidency and and looking at how his you know trump's relationship with um far-right forces and fascist forces evolved over time and and how well that that uh, relationship is something that was very important to his his political project and you know has been since he declared his uh, presidential candidacy in 2015 that the the specifics of uh, of that relationship have really uh, changed in important ways and um, are things that you know that's something that we really need to understand. Uh, but then also um, there are several essays that look at the George Floyd uh, rebellion and the um, the upsurge of anti-police uh, activism and anti-police riots that happened in 2020. Um, and um, and again, going beyond sort of pat explanations to look at some of the complexities there in terms of you know, not just seeing this as a black movement, quote unquote, but as a a multiracial, multi class movement that was uh, black led, um, but had many different uh, constituencies and 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 forces uh, working together, but also it, to varying degrees in tension with each other. Looking at the dynamics uh, between reformist and revolutionary forces, and you know some of those those issues. And then lastly, um, there are a number of pieces in the book that look at questions of organizing and strategy. And, you know, this is something that, I mean, we could devote a whole discussion to, but but uh, it's something that just to, you know, touch on a, a, a few of the themes. I mean, I've already mentioned uh, uh, some things in relation to uh, the anti-fascism and uh, anti-fascism against machismo piece, just the need to challenge um, male supremacist um, dynamics and assumptions within anti-fascist uh, uh, movements and, and activism, uh, but also looking at um, just the need for um, uh, ways to develop movements that are both militant and inclusive, ways to develop movements that are community based and not simply, you know, coming in as, you know, sort of, you know, a sort of an arrogant uh, vanguardist approach and, you know, sort of um, trying to, um, you know, act as if, you know, okay, well, we're, we're the, uh, 
the most advanced sector. And so therefore we're going to, you know, um, run the show. Um, there's a, there's a whole piece about, uh, a confrontation in, uh, Auburn, Al Alabama, a, a, an anti-fascist confrontation with, uh, Richard Spencer and the alt-right forces that he was leading where, um, the, um, folks who saw themselves as the most advanced anti-fascists, um, ended up in, in a very, playing a very minor role in, in terms of the movement that acted uh, effectively to run him out of town, run Spencer out of town, but in a way that was clearly not under the uh, control of, um, you know, the black bloc or something like that. Uh, and then uh, just to give one, one last example of the uh, organizing discussion, there's a, you know, the most recent piece that's uh, most, uh, the, the uh, most recently written piece that's included in the book is called Gaming's Three-Way Fight, which looks at political struggle within the uh, video and online gaming community uh, as an arena where um, there has been a tremendous amount of uh, activism by far rightists, you know, where they, you know, recognize that this is a, you know, this is a, a huge area where, you know, particularly young people are, you know, very involved. And so there's, there's, a, there's a huge potential for recruitment and propaganda and so forth. And so that's a, that's a, that's a real danger and a real reality. But then you also have a, a, a kind of liberal, uh, uh, reaction, which has been very much about surveillance, about, um, developing, uh, you know, uh, police efforts or, you know, other kind of pro-state efforts to monitor and control these spaces. And so the, the gaming's three-way fight authors are arguing that we, what we need is a, a, a uh, an approach that is both anti-fascist and, uh, critical of this kind of pro-state approach and that takes a, a more community-based uh, approach to challenging the far right and being critical of the kind of surveillance model and that also looks at ways to use the uh, gaming spaces as an opportunity to develop radical visions, whether it's through uh, just the kind of networking that's going on or the development uh, or use of games in, in ways that um, help people to um, uh, articulate and, and, and develop um, radical ideas and, 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 and visions. Um, all right, so that's, that's everything we wanted to cover, I think. I mean, Christian, do you have anything you want to add just in terms of... Uh, Wrapping things up before we turn it over to Q and A. Not really. Uh, maybe a little. A little comment is that having been approached to do this book four years ago. Uh, if you remember, Matthew, we we had to think and rethink over like what we wanted the book to represent, and you know. It, it exists, what we came up with was both a book of foundational documents explaining that, uh, we talked about that art, but uh, really kind of injecting in there the kind of the, the praxis, the practice, the organizing. So what I want to say is that we finished this book up a, just because this is how things happen in the publishing world. You know, we, we basically got the book ready about a year ago, making adjustments, having to do editing. The world moves at such a fast pace now that things a week ago, two weeks ago, seems like history. And uh, so some of the documents in here that we put from two years, four years, 10 years longer, it can seem, um, It's it, it, a question could be raised of what is the relevance of something from 30 years ago to now? And we thought really hard about that. And what we try to do with this book is trying to situate it in a historical perspective of saying, once again, going back to the static, old realities, new realities, that there's common threads that run through it. So while this book is kind of situates in, in, in these previous books, there's more books to be wrote.
there's there's more work to be done. There's more thinking that we have to to struggle through. So what we hope with this book is that it it's it's more it's a tool it's more ammunition for our side to uh, to, to to develop some some strategies and practice around. So anyway, that's all. It's just it's really struck me at how fast events move today and how it's easy for us to lose sight of the importance of works that came out not too long ago. Um, so anyway, once again, I think it's it's the verdict will be from you as readers uh, to to dig into it and and see where it resonates with uh, struggles today. And I, I speaking for Matthew and myself, I think we see a lot in this book that is is applicable and useful, but not as not as any kind of cookie cutter kind of way. Uh, it's it's a it's a way of thinking and an analysis. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, y'all. I really appreciate your your thorough introduction to the book and also to the the tendency. Um, I do want to encourage everybody who's here with us to um, please uh, do give us some questions. Um, don't make me ask all the questions. We want yours. Um, but I will, I'll kick us off here um, and ask a question that comes up for me. Um, well, first, I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, that part of what y'all are doing is attempting to define kind of uh, slippery terms um, that we use every day on the left, but don't always interrogate. Uh, and, and even something just like the word fascism, there's obviously so many different definitions of what fascism is. Um, and, and even within the three-way fight, um, kind of like writer's cohort, there's clearly some, some you know, differences in perspective here. Uh, but it's just such an incredibly valuable project to wrestle with what these terms mean. Um, Thinking though about fascism, you know, on the left, there is a kind of a longstanding kind of uh, uh, thought, um, particularly I think from, uh, you know, black and indigenous theorists about fascism at the core of the kind of uh, US American political body. Um, and I'm thinking here about, um, you know, like the work that the Black Panther Party did uh, that was anti-fascist like the um, United Front Against Fascism that was organized in 1969, um, which was really not focused on an insurgent right. It was focused on the political system itself, on police violence. And I guess I'm curious if there's a tension between the idea of fascism as being something that is within the political system uh, versus the idea of fascism as principally being located within like a, a system oppositional like far right movement. Um, maybe I can take a crack at that. Um, big question. That's yeah, a it's a big question. And I, again, I, um, I mean, you know, I can give my take on it, uh, you know, or at least a, a little piece of my take on it. Uh, but, you know, without, you know, wanting to suggest it's any sort of definitive answer. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, first of all, it, it, to me, it, it just a basic thing about when we're talking about fascism, I mean, as you, you know, as you noted, Liberty, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of defining it. And I think it's important to just keep in mind that it's not, it's not a matter of, you know, that fascism is there's sort of some objective thing. And it's a matter of, you know, discovering what the true nature of fascism is. Fascism is a is a category. It's a concept that we use, and unless you're talking about you know just you know Mussolini's Italian fascist party, which called itself fascist, most people who we would call fascist don't call themselves fascist. So if you're looking at the category more broadly, then it's it's not a question of what is the true objective nature of fascism. It's a question of how do we develop the concept in a way that is most useful for understanding and for strategy. And that's something that is, it's inevitably gonna be an ongoing discussion. It's not like there's one answer and, you know, and then we're done. Um, our 
approach is based on uh, the idea that uh, in this historical period in North America, uh, which may not apply to all times and places, but uh, in this context, that it's most useful analytically and strategically to think about fascism as basically an oppositional force. And part of the issue here is that it, people often use the term fascism as interchangeable with authoritarianism or dictatorship. And clearly there's a relationship there, but there are a lot of different kinds of authoritarianism and dictatorship that I would not call fascism. I mean, you, would, you, you can have an absolute monarchy, you can have a theocracy, you can have a military dictatorship, all of which are brutal and repressive, but they're not based on the same kind of political dynamic as uh, you know what you saw uh, in uh, Nazi Germany, for example, or or it, it, you know Mussolini's Italy, where it you know it was a uh, it involved a a mass mobilization of people outside of the established uh, you know standard uh, political institutions that uh, was based on um, a, a vision of transformation of society, in, in, you know, based on a, 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 a particular ideology of uh, supremacist um, um, renewal. Um, that's very different than, um, you know, a military coup, coup that just puts a lot of people in jail in order to keep people in power without having any particular ideological vision, for example. Um, if we're talking about, you know, the Black Panther Party specifically, since you, you raise as an example, um, I mean, the, the Black Panther Party, um, their position on fascism evolved. I mean, they had a fairly short life, but I mean, if you look at their, their original program, they don't even mention fascism in their original program. It's something that they came to address as a, an important critical uh, concern in response to the kind of repression that they experienced of being subjected to jailings and assassinations and, and you know, other, you know, just I intense violent repression. Uh, so for them, it was, it was something that was very much uh, an expression of their experience in, in a repressive uh, political context. Um, and it, it, I don't want to deny that that reality. I, I, I do want to say that I think that if, you know, in terms of trying to make sense of our, our situation here and now, I, I, I don't think it is the most uh, helpful um, to say that, you know, we live in a fascist, uh, you know, in a fascist, we, that, you know, fascism is already here as, you know, as George Jackson put it in, you know, blood in my eye. Um, I don't think it's already here. I don't think we would be having this discussion if it were already here, not in public. You want to add anything, Christian? Well, no surprise. I, I'm, I'm in general agreement with you. I, I think in terms of what the Panthers were trying to describe by using the category of fascism is often what indigenous First Nations folks uh, in North America uh, and, and those who lived under colonialist rule in, in the capitalist kind of colonies and periphery, it's this authoritarian genocidal uh, repressive uh, system. And I'm very sympathetic extremely sympathetic uh, to how people understandably would look at fascism historically and see that that is what took place and is what is happening. I would, you know, echo what, what you said, Matthew, um, but like I said, I'm very sympathetic to it. I actually think as anti-fascists, here we just put out a book on anti-fascism, revolutionary policy anti-fascism, but in many ways, 
what we're trying to say and what I think that as our movements need to get at is fascism is not always the most helpful category. And we need to think harder about what it is we're up against. Um, and so, you know, I'll just kind of leave it at that. You know, I've kind of said before that we need to explode the notion of fascism. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, is we need to broaden it. Uh, I, in many ways, use the concept of the far right now. I used to not use that, but I think the far right is a much more, well, it's vague and, and amorphous. It's much more accurate in describing the array of reactionary forces, both kind of within the system, as well as system adjacent kind of far right uh, and at times insurgent uh, far right politics. So um, like I said, big question, uh, it's an essential question. And I'm not sure that we have the sufficient answer, but you know, once again, we, we've tried to get at some of that discussion in this book. If, if I could just kind of piggyback on, on the, the last point, uh that Christian made. Um, I, I think that, um, I mean, in, the, in this historical moment, you know, the question of fascism in the US, you know, I mean, people often look at it in relation to Donald Trump and, you know, his, you know, what he stands for and, you know, what, you know, a another Trump presidency would, um, you know, where that would lead. Um, and I, I think that, you know, again, we could have a whole discussion about that. And I think there are, you know, very serious dangers there in terms of, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, threat to uh, the kind of pluralistic space that does exist in, in, uh, in this country based on, you know, generations of struggle that, that people have waged to carve out that space. Um, but um, what I want to say is um, that part of the uh, effect that Trump's entry into the U.S. national politics and you know the kind of political initiative that he's led, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, there was a very important uh, relationship between his political campaigns and the, the far right, which, you know, the, the, the far right existing outside of the organized, um, you know, political mainstream outside of the Republican party and so forth, uh, where there was a kind of symbiosis that helped, uh, helped to propel his candidacy and where he was able to make use of um, those kind of forces to aid his campaigns. Uh, and they in turn got, you know, kind of legitimacy and uh, validation and attention that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So that kind of symbiotic relationship is important. But one of the effects that uh, his campaigns and his presidency have had has been to um, erode the kind of dividing lines that uh, previously existed between the kind of mainstream right and the kind of uh, insurgent or, or, you know, far right, uh, that, you know, has largely positioned itself in opposition to established conservatism. Um, that line has become much more blurry and where you, you now see, um, certain, um, groups that, you know, are generally identified as far right, such as the Groypers, Groyper movement, being directly involved in, you know, kind of mainstream conservative spaces and, you know, being very explicit about that as a strategy. And then you also see uh, institutions and organizations within that kind of mainstream space taking up positions that, you know, not that long ago were really not seen as acceptable within that space, but were, were, were the province... I'm sorry, they were friends. They kind were of fringe. fringe. Yeah, and I mean the Heritage Foundation's um, Project Twenty Twenty Five, I think, is a prime example of that. Where it's you know this is an an organization that you know started out as um, you know a champion of you know the Reagan Revolution and you know what was basically neoliberalism, mm 
uh, it's not promoting neo neoliberalism anymore. Um, it's promoting a, a kind of right wing populism that is pretty explicitly authoritarian and, um, um, you know, again, is, is taking ideas and um, strategies that that come from outside of you know the the Republican establishment and and injecting them into that space. So again, it's it's it's. I, I mean, I'm I'm sort of straying away from the question of you know what is fascism and so on, but 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 it, 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 there's a need to go beyond you know these kind of static categories and to look at the concrete realities of a changing situation, and to. You know, let's use the categories to try to make sense of things, but but let's also recognize that those categories are are you know they're always changing, and there's a dynamic uh, there that that um, it, it, it it's going to change the meanings and, and and change the relationships. Yeah, and I guess it goes without saying that even within the far right, there are extremely variant um, kind of tendencies. Um, so nothing can be really collapsed into a single identity, but. Um, well, to me, oh, go ahead, Jonah. I think part of what we wanted to do with the book and, and even in the title, the subtitle is Revolutionary Politics and Anti-Fascism. And there has always been this tension within the anti-fascist movements. I mean, for the length of of when anti-fascism arose in, in the, 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 the 1910s uh, in response to the fascist movements, you know what? What are the fa anti-fascist forces fighting for? You know, is it is are they fighting for the defense of the republic? You know, are they fighting for a revolutionary alternative, uh, or or what's motivating that? And and I think what we wanted to try to say with this book is that having uh, an analysis and centering fascism in the far right uh, as a as a as an, a, a response or a symptom of this, this society and politics, uh, centering that in our broader politics is essential, but we have to have a much more revolutionary, we have to have a full critique and, and intransient kind of uh, intransigence to, to the system itself. And just having a anti-fascism that is fighting to, to carve out or maintain breathing space or the defense of the Republic is not enough because this society, this system is genocidal. It's grinding people down. It gives privileges to some while completely, you know, withholding or, or denying them to others, whatever privileges we have freedoms, we have other people are facing death and destruction elsewhere. Uh, so we have to have a full anti-system critique and, and praxis. And I think in the modern age for most anti-fascists, they go, well, duh, don't we all? But that's not always the case. And just going back to one thing we've raised before is that the ruling class, like the Democratic Party, all their proxies, they have their own anti-fascism in defense of this system. You know, if we look at you know, Biden and the DSA and all these other groups, you know, uh, previously they all offered up their own anti-fascist uh, platform against Trump, against the far right. That's insufficient. We have to defend what gains we have, but we have to have a much more expansive view and, and forms of organizing and struggle and creating movements and alliances. So I think just with this book, it's, it's having the anti-fascist, anti-far-right perspective, but it has to be part of this broader vision of, of liberatory resistance. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Very well said. Um, well, we were talking about this, Christian, before the event started, but I feel like I'd be remiss, given that we're in North Carolina, um, to not ask you about um, kind of the, the legacy of the Greensboro massacre. Um, and I'm curious if you'd be willing to it's possible that people might need just uh, the tiniest bit of explanation. Um, I guess in broad strokes, this is an event that happened in 1979 um, when uh, there was sort of a, a coordination between the Klan and the American Nazi Party, which I, I believe was somewhat unusual at the time um, uh, to uh, attack uh, a communist, uh, communist Worker Party rally 
Um, and this resulted in the kind of like a one-sided bloodbath in which five uh, communist party members in Greensboro were uh, were killed. Um, and I understand that, you know, this comes up in the book a couple times, um, and it, it seems that it, you know, had a, a somewhat significant impact on the trajectory of um, kind of anti-fascist organizing in the United States. Could you say just a little bit about that, since it is sort of our, our local history? Uh, yeah, I mean, there had been, I mean, in North Carolina, in, in throughout North Carolina, but in, in Greensboro, in Durham, Chapel Hill, throughout the Piedmont, uh, you know, as well as elsewhere in the country, there there was there were various struggles over integration, busing. Um, for all intents and purposes, a lot of school systems, uh, communities were were still de uh, were still segregated, uh, and there was, as you said, there there was this coordinated attack uh, by the Klan and the Nazis, and they were in many places and historically had uh, the Klan had opposed the, the Nazis. Um, but in the 70s, there, there was a big effort, a big, a big move by folks like Duke and his various dragons to Nazify the Klan. And that was a, that was a, a, a major shift uh, that's coming out of the, the, the Vietnam, uh, the defeat of the US in Vietnam, um, the demobilization of a lot of, uh, of the soldiers coming home uh, the feeling that they felt that the system had turned their backs on them. Anyway, uh, Duke really mobilized uh, folks from from that period and and took Nazi politics into the Klan. Anyway, there was this attack on on the Communist Workers Party, and um, that was still playing out. I moved from Detroit down to North Carolina in that period, and. The Nazis were still, they were marching in the streets. I remember when we first got down there, I was probably 11, and Glenn Miller's, um, who was a, a Nazi uh, leader, you know, he had a paramilitary march through Chapel Hill, uh, through the streets of Chapel Hill. And, uh, and that was picked up by lots of youth, and then you had the neo-Nazi skinhead movement. So there was all these different things feeding off each other. But yeah, the 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 murder of, of the five... Um, communist workers party folks had a polarizing effect on the anti-fascist left at the time. And it scared a lot of folks, rightfully so. People were being murdered, shot dead in the streets. Uh, so it had a, a, a itself a demobilizing effect on aspects of the anti-fascist or anti-racist left. But it also meant um, for other members of the, of the, the revolutionary communist or socialist or anarchist movements to kind of think of new ways to combat this this new emerging Nazi clan, and uh, and that carried over, I think, into the work of what would become anti-racist action, uh, where we those movements really dealt with the questions of of a violent, murderous Nazi clan. Um, uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, definitely, my own influence was having to deal with 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 those struggles 10 years after the fact, after the massacre, uh, that was still resonating in the 80s and even into the early 90s uh, in in places in North Carolina. Uh, and a lot of it was being played out by young people, young people um, being faced with choices about how they were gonna respond to like racist attacks. Uh, you know, what for, for me it was, what what side are you gonna be on? Are you gonna be on, on the white racist side? Are you gonna align yourself with like, Black youth defending themselves against the attacks in the Klan. And uh, of course, I chose the latter. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of youth did. A lot of us did. So uh, anyway, I don't know if, that, if that's really a... It, it was a significant struggle, but it was a significant struggle in a scope of things happening all over the U.S. And um, yeah. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about the Greensboro massacre as a turning point for the U.S. far right, which was also extremely important. Um, one of the critical, so there were two things that I think were were most critical about the Greensboro massacre, other than the just the the appalling character of the violence itself. First was this convergence of 
Klan and Nazi forces, which had been uh, uh, enemies, uh, generally speaking, traditionally, uh, before that. The other is it was a, uh, a, a mass killing that was carried out with the direct uh, collusion and participation of agents of the U.S. government. Uh, there was a, uh, an agent of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms who was working undercover. There was an informer for the, the FBI, both of whom were directly involved in the planning and organization and preparation of the, the, the murders. Uh, and this was, um, you know, the latest in a, a series of uh, initiatives uh, that had been carried out by U.S. federal forces, uh, you know, it, it, certainly in the 1960s, where there was, you know, FBI collusion in murders of civil rights workers. But, it, you know, it's a much longer history than that. But the aftermath of the Greensboro massacre was uh, something that it took the 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 far right in a, in a very different direction because with the Nazification of the Klan, I mean the Klan in the '60s and you know uh, you know up until the '70s, up until Duke uh, was a, a essentially a a backward looking movement, a movement that was about defending the old order, about you know, protecting segregation or restoring segregation, you know, turning back the clock. But then with the Nazification, what you got was a new vision, a vision that said, no, we're not about restoring the old order. We need to break away from this whole system or overthrow it entirely. And within just a few years of the Greensboro massacre, you not only had you know, people like Glenn Miller taking his Confederate Knights of the Ku Klux Klan and turning it into the White Patriot Party, a very different image and a very different ideology. But you also had groups like the Order, which uh, literally uh, declared war, formally and explicitly declared war on the U.S. government, took up arms and engaged in a series of um, physical, you know, shooting confrontations with uh, law enforcement and was subjected to a whole crackdown by the Reagan administration as a result. So that then, you know, defined a whole new period of relationship where instead of being, you know, vigilantes in support of the system, the far right became guerrillas and an underground that was trying to either break away from, you know, secede from the United States or overthrow it. And, you know, that, that there's been, you know, different versions of that and, you know, sort of ebbs and flows of militancy since then. But, but, but that, you know, the, the you know, the, the political prisoners, uh, you know, who, you know, members of the order who went to prison you know, for decades uh, in the 1980s, you know, continued to be revered by um, by far rightists um, since then. And Whidbey Island up there in uh, Washington is where uh, the FBI and ATF actually murdered the order's leader. Uh, uh, and that became for, you know, 20 some years, annual celebratory places for the neo-Nazi movement. Um, just real quickly add on to what Matthew says, and I think this relates to us today when we're thinking about Trump and, and what's on the horizon with, with the far right in the U.S. Uh, and MAGA is we don't know what's going to happen. The politics and societal changes shift really rapidly. And where things were, say, seven years ago when we saw the alt-right emerge and uh, and Charlottesville and around the country, the mass brawls and street fights um, and literally war on the streets, people being hurt and murdered. Uh, we didn't know where things were going. And I think understandably people thought it's gonna get bad and it did get really bad. The last couple years has seen not everywhere, but in a lot of places, a less dramatic political situation involving the far right. Where 
the Republican Party itself has moved further and further uh, in a mass way to the right and embraced a lot of the far right's kind of politics and visions. It's at the same time demobilized the more militant insurgent aspects for the moment of, of what we saw. Now, the question is going to be, is it going to sustain? Is that going to sustain itself? We don't know. So we have to start thinking of different different scenarios. We have to start organizing. We have to think broadly about how we're going to respond today, three months, six months from now. Um, what are we going to be up against? You know, is the is the far right going to continue to kind of be on the edges of this official politics, or could we see the emergence of 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 something new, kind of like what we saw and what Matthew was talking about with the the kind of the Nazification and uh, and and the different direction that the um, that the the Klan went uh, into the seventies and eighties. We don't know, but we got to start thinking about that. Um, and and that's no no easy task. And uh, don't want to end on a on a negative point, but we're also we're all in a period of regroupment because a lot of the forces and movements and organizations that we had seven, eight years ago, they're no longer existing. You know, we have less of a, a movement infrastructure in ways um, than we did, yet people's anger and people's indignation and people wanting to like struggle, organize, and fight back is at a higher level than ever. But it's it's very atomized. And um, we're in a very difficult spot, I think. Uh, so, so <laughs> I, I want to just offer a little bit of a flip side of that, which is that I think that um, we, you know, you know, without glossing over, you know, any of the reality that, that Christian is describing, I mean, I think we can also look back on some real successes and some victories that, um, you know, our, our movements have achieved, I mean, you know, in, in a number of arenas, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking back specifically to um, the early, you know, the first couple of years of the Trump presidency, where, um, you know, there was an attempt by the alt-right as, you know, what was at that time the most dynamic sector of the fascist far right, but was very much confined to a kind of online space they made a real push to develop, a, you know, a physical presence to, you know, have, you know, um, rallies and demonstrations and marches and have a physical presence that, you know, would link up with other far right forces. And that failed. It failed um, partly because of their own internal weaknesses and uh, infighting, but it failed also because of uh, opposition and uh, sustained and 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 you know smart and 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 uh, well organized um, resistance that you know people on the left put together, and you know I it, it's not like okay that's the end of the story, but I think that there are, are ways that you know we it's useful to look back and say all right what was it what worked well there. You know, what has worked well in other kinds of confrontations? What has worked well in situations that aren't as glamorous as, you know, a street confrontation, but, you know, where people have been effective in diffusing or, um, uh, you know, weakening or um, otherwise, um, you know, effectively countering far right forces? Um, what has worked well in uh, people's efforts to counter state repression? you know, which is something that's been pursued um, under both Republican and Democratic presidents, not in the same ways and not with the same intensity, but um, that's, but that's a reality that um, is, is there. Um, so I think, you know, that that's part of what we're about too, is like looking at the, the struggles and trying to, to draw uh, real lessons without, you know, without glamorizing, without, you know, glossing over the, the failures and the mistakes. But, you know, there's there's things that have that, that we can learn.
I need Matthew to to help me uh, work work through my pessimism at times, you know. Uh, but I completely agree with uh, he's absolutely right, and uh, no points well taken. Well, y'all are a great pair for a conversation. Um, we are amazingly sort of at time here. I don't know where it all went. Um, maybe just to take us out, uh, would love to hear um, uh, some combination of either. Uh, kind of what's next, things y'all are working on, or um, alternately or additionally, uh, things that you think people should be keeping an eye on, um, other projects, uh, other websites um, that you'd recommend to folks who tuned in tonight? Well, it, um, I mean, this is one of a of a, a series of events that that we're doing. I mean, and uh, most of the the uh, events are, are are local. They're not necessarily recorded, uh, so they won't necessarily be uh, uh, available for you know a, a wider audience. But we're trying to um, use the book as a, a vehicle for holding discussions. In a number of cities around the country, and you know, well, it, both the U.S. and Canada, really, um, to um, to address you know some of these issues in a more concrete way, and and you know, look at some of the the, the local situations, uh, you know, a, as appropriate. So that's something that's going to be ongoing, and and we encourage other people to uh, to do that in you know in 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 other ways, you know, so, um, that's, that's something. And, and, um, you know, it, we are continuing to, um, develop the, the three way fight website, um, that we actually had a whole overhaul of the site. It's got a whole new look, um, and, um, you know, continuing to, you know, publish content there. Uh, and, you know, we're going to continue to, um, try to de develop the project and, you know, bring, you know, more, more voices in and, 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 you know, be in, in dialogue with, um, with, with other folks. And like I said earlier, if, if people read the book or, or check out the website, or if they have questions, if people want to write responses to, to what they read or what they see, please do send us. I mean, that's the whole, that is the whole point of it. You know, an old book that we put out, confronting fascism was discussion documents for a militant movement. And in many ways, this three-way fight book is that part too. It's it's discussion documents. It's supposed to stimulate movement-wide discussion. So uh, please do. Also, uh, please check out the, the the great folks who put our, uh, help publish this book, PM Press and Chris Blebedev. And they are, uh, they're constantly putting out great re books, resources, reading materials, as well as other stuff uh, for for uh, all of us. Um, so check that out. And in terms of resources, we're constantly, uh, with our new website, we're trying to update our resources page so people can look at that. Um, and other than that, uh, thank you. Well, thanks to both of you. This has been a really stimulating conversation and there's so much more to get into. Um, Folks can grab the book as a as a jumping off point if they haven't already, or maybe catch one of your in person events. So, yeah, much appreciation to you both. Thank you. All right. Well, good night, everybody, and thanks to everybody who tuned in. Take care.